The Mexican economy was in a complete freefall in the 1980s. High inflation, high debt, and a retracting GDP all contributed to very hard times in Mexico. To see how Mexico got to this point, check out part one of this series by clicking in the top right corner or following the link below. Otherwise, stay here to witness Mexico's transformation from a nation in crisis to a nation of exceptional growth. A transformation that would leave a lasting legacy across the entire North American continent. The crisis of the 80s created the ultimate stress test for Mexico's pillars of power. The government could no longer afford to keep failing businesses on life support. The powers that be had no other choice but to move towards privatization. Business leaders and workers who are on the losing end of privatization became antagonized with the PRI, Mexico's monopolistic political party. These conditions made for an interesting presidential election in 1988. For the first time in nearly 60 years, the PRI faced legitimate opposition in the form of the PAN party and the FDN party. The PAN was a coalition of big businesses and their workers, whereas the FDN represented a rebellious faction of former PRI members. As the PRI was very much the government up to this point, they were in charge of counting the votes and early voting returns indicated that a pre-victory was unlikely. And wouldn't you know it, the computers used to count the votes suddenly stopped working. How strange. But this wasn't an issue for the pre. They had no problem declaring themselves as the winners the following morning. How convenient for the pre. But faulty computers weren't the only irregularities. Mi abuelita todavía está votando. Mi abuelita, mi papá, bueno, todos están votando y ya murieron. The opposition parties and the Mexican people were outraged. Not enough to spark another revolution, but pretty close. While the PRI would remain in power, they had to make democratic concessions for the sake of stability. The perfect dictatorship would have to end. The man in charge of Mexico after the fraudulent election was Carlos Salinas and he had a very challenging to-do list. Stop inflation, solve the debt crisis, get the Mexican economy to grow again, and peacefully guide Mexico into a legitimate democracy. And just to make things more challenging for Salinas, there was an indigenous rebellion in the state of Chiapas, although that rebellion was pacified by mostly diplomatic means. Mostly. While Salinas had monumental challenges before him, he did have one crucial advantage, a strictly enforced term limit. Regardless of his popularity, or lack thereof, the Mexican constitution prohibits presidents from serving multiple terms. In many democracies, politicians tend to be too focused on seeking re-election instead of providing good governance. This would not be a concern for Salinas, or any other modern Mexican president for that matter. Mexican presidents serve for six years, not a day longer or shorter. This structuring allows presidents to make tough decisions that may result in short-term pain, but provide substantial long-term benefits. This would be great for Mexico because Salinas had to make tremendous changes that would be quite painful in the short term. The first order of business was inflation. Most of Mexico's inflation was due to good old-fashioned money printing. Sounds easy enough to fix but not really. Mexico wasn't printing money just for the fun of it. They were doing it to keep the government functioning. Should the money printing stop, then the government would become insolvent and an even greater crisis would ensue. But Salinas had a plan and he put his Harvard degrees to work. His first step was to renegotiate debt to slow down the bleeding of cash. Salinas went hat in hand to George H.W. Bush, London bankers, and the International Monetary Fund. These foreign financiers were happy to help Mexico, so long as they made some sacrifices at the altar of neoliberalism. Debt restructuring came with the mandate of privatization. Many of Mexico's remaining state-owned enterprises would have to be put on the auction block for non-government bidders. Nosotros privatizamos los bancos, la compañía telefónica, las líneas aéreas, 
la siderurgia, las minas. Estamos ahora procediendo a privatizar los puertos, los aeropuertos. No hay modelos. En México lo que nos ha funcionado es un sistema de privatización a través de subasta pública. Privatization was part of Salinas's plan from the beginning. Some of Mexico's biggest enterprises would be sold to private owners. The most notable example being Telmex, which was the entire telecom industry in Mexico. Telmex fetched an impressive price of 3.53 billion US dollars. When adjusted for inflation to today's money, that's a lot of pesos. And unlike his predecessors in the 70s, Salinas made smart moves with this influx of cash. First, he shut off the money printing machines. Due to the funds from privatization, the government could now pay its own bills. There is no need to keep printing money, and there is plenty of cash left over to make massive payments on Mexico's outstanding debts. Both inflation and debt rates dramatically decreased during privatization. While privatization was well managed by Salinas, it is not without criticism. Certain deals had the stench of corruption, particularly the Telmex deal. The telecom was purchased for $3.5 billion, despite only having assets valued at $1.3 billion. Given their projected revenues, and that all state-owned enterprises are inherently inefficient, something didn't seem quite right with the very high markup. Where there's smoke, there's probably fire. And that was the case for the Telmex deal. The new private owners of Telmex essentially bought a monopoly, and they gouged prices for consumers. After the acquisition, they raised rates by nearly 250%. As it would take time for other telecom competitors to emerge, Mexicans had no other alternatives during the price gouging. The shady behavior created Mexico's first billionaire, in Carlos Slim, and he would hold the title of the richest person in the world for a few years. Similar corruption accusations can be found in other privatization deals. Banks? were sold for three times their book value, with the promise that there would be no foreign competition for 15 years. Televisa, which accounted for 90% of Mexican television viewership, was protected from competition for 12 years. Salinas would face accusations of turning Mexico from a mixed economy into an oligarchy, but the expiration dates on the protectionist clauses made all the difference. Yes, the private buyers would enjoy monopoly-like advantages. But just like the Mexican presidency, the monopolies came with a strictly enforced term limit. Salinas invited foreign investors to partake in privatization, which also hedged against the risk of oligarchy. In total, 126 foreign investors would be involved in privatization, notably the British company Unilever which bought big swaths of Mexico's food processing industry. Allowing foreign investment into the Mexican economy raised some populist eyebrows. But with the taming of inflation, Salinas enjoyed impressive approval ratings during privatization. During the privatization bonanza, Mexico's most sacred state-owned enterprise would not be sold. Pemex remains a state-owned monopoly to this day. Salinas saved Mexico from collapse, but his to-do list was unfinished. Now it was time to build up the Mexican economy. Taking inspiration from the economic boom of globalization, Salinas decided it was time to get Mexico into the business of free trade. Mexico was poised to do very well as an export-based economy, assuming the president could broker a free trade agreement. He first reached out to the rich nations of Europe, and the Europeans said no. Spain and Portugal had just joined the EU in 1986, and the Iberians would provide cheap labor for the richer European countries. The EU also planned expanding eastward, as the Berlin Wall had just fallen. When Spain and Portugal started demanding higher wages, the EU would then rely on the Slavs for cheap labor. Europe simply didn't need Mexico. 
and would much rather employ fellow Europeans. But Mexico shouldn't feel insulted by Europe. It's not personal. It's geopolitics. For Mexico to tap into globalization's wealth creation, they would have to go north. While this made a lot of geographic and logistical sense, it would be a monumental political challenge on both sides of the border. Mexicans have a love-hate relationship with their northern neighbor. On the citizen level, there's a lot of love. As for the pre's attitude towards the United States government, that's where most of the hate comes from. Some of this is rooted in legitimate historical grievances. And other distrust stems from anti-US propaganda during the oil glut crisis of the 80s. If the people were getting too restless, the PRI could just blame all of Mexico's problems on the gringos. Having a government-owned television monopoly has its perks. The 80s were ripe with anti-US propaganda and conspiracy theories. That made Mexicans uneasy about getting into bed with Uncle Sam. Salinas had some persuading to do. This was a tremendous change in the way Mexico dealt with its mighty uh, neighbor to the north. Because um, in the past, in the 19th century, when some people tried to build the railroad between the border at Laredo and Mexico City, there was a Mexican president who said, we have had so many bad moments in the relationship that instead of the railroads, I prefer the sand of the desert to be between Mexico and the US. And later on, another Mexican president said, of oh, the difficulty of this relationship, poor Mexico, so far from God and so close to the US. This was the type of uh, mentalities that we had to change. By the way, when I told these um, reflections to a friend of mine, <coughs> the governor of the Bank of uh, Israel, Michael Bruno, he said, Mr. President, it's very peculiar because here in Israel we say the reverse. And I asked, what do you mean? Yes, we say poor Israel, so close to God and so far from the U.S. But <laughs> nevertheless, it's a matter of geopolitical realities. And ours is the one we were facing and the one we were trying to change. But lucky for Salinas, he had sky-high approval ratings at this time. If he told the people that they could now trust the Gringos, the people would trust him. I believe in a strategic uh, alliance between government, entrepreneurs, and workers in order to compete in a global economy that we are going to face. Persuading the Americans to make a free trade agreement would be a bit more challenging. Should the U.S. agree to free trade with Mexico, their already suffering manufacturing sector would be gutted. The only way to compete with cheap foreign labor is with tariffs. Whichever political party opened free trade with Mexico was bound to face criticism from the opposition party. This meant that Salinas had to persuade both American parties for free trade to last. Again, he put his Harvard degrees to work. He explained to his U.S. counterparts that America's best days were behind them. Unless they acted quickly, the East Asian tigers were rising and could easily replace America's economic dominance. And that wasn't the only threat to American economic superiority. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the EU was poised to expand eastward. The EU was destined to become an economic superpower, one that could easily surpass the United States. But the US could keep the title of world's biggest economy without antagonizing their allies. All they had to do was open up to free trade with Mexico. Mexico could provide cheap labor for American businesses, allowing them to remain competitive with Europe and East Asia. It was a simple proposition for the Americans. Work with Mexico and prosper, or slowly fall behind Europe and East Asia. Salinas had no problem getting support from the Republican Party. After all, Ronald Reagan had advocated for a North American Union since at least 1979. We live on a continent whose three countries possess the assets to make it the strongest, most prosperous, and self-sufficient area on Earth. 
Within the borders of this North American continent are the food, resources, technology, and undeveloped territory which properly managed could dramatically improve the quality of life of all its inhabitants. And so a developing closeness among Canada, Mexico, and the United States, a North American accord would permit achievement of that potential in each country beyond that which I believe any of us, strong as we are, could accomplish in the presence or the absence, I should say, of such cooperation. The Democrat Party needed a bit more persuading due to their political alliance with the labor unions and the working class. But Salinas worked his magic and was able to persuade the donkeys. However, both parties would have to do their own persuading to try to get the American people on board. The peace and friendship that uh, we have long enjoyed as neighbors will now be strengthened by the explosion of growth and trade let loose by the combined energies of our 360 million citizens trading freely across our borders. We make the best tires in the world, but we have a hard time selling them in Mexico because they have a 20% tax collected at the border on all of the tires that we try to sell. Now, when they make tires and sell them into the United States, the tax at the border is zero. So it's, it's a one-way street. NAFTA changes that. Salinas made one small error in his calculation of U.S. politics. Every now and then, a third-party candidate can rise to power. Meet Ross Perot, a billionaire who got fed up with America's duopoly of political power and decided to run for president. And this Texan wasn't too keen on free trade with Mexico. We have got to stop sending jobs overseas. To those of you in the audience who are business people, pretty simple. If you're paying $12, $13, $14 an hour for factory workers, and you can move your factory south of the border, pay a dollar an hour for your labor, have no health care, that's the most expensive single element in making a car, have no environmental controls, no pollution controls, and no retirement, and you don't care about anything but making money, there will be a giant sucking sound going south. When the election arrived, Perot received about 19% of the popular vote. Not enough to get to the White House, but still a very impressive turnout for a third-party candidate. While Perot ran on many issues, his hostility towards free trade with Mexico was a major cornerstone. An issue which remains politically relevant to this day. But this would not be Salinas' problem. He had successfully persuaded America's two major parties. And free trade with the United States was a done deal. Salinas never intended to include Canada into the free trade agreement. But the milkbaggers forced themselves in anyways. The US and Canada already had a free trade deal. And Canada was afraid they would eventually get dumped for Mexico. As the Canadian economy is highly reliant on trade with the US, they could not risk getting left out of the deal. Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney had a pretty good relationship with George H.W. Bush and had no problem securing Canada's access to the deal. And with that, the North American Free Trade Agreement was born. NAFTA was a bit of a compromise for Salinas, as he had much grander free trade ambitions. It is speculated that he wanted to go as far as to create a union that would be comparable to the EU. This union of the Americas would not only include the three amigos, but also Costa Rica, Chile, Venezuela, and Colombia. But Salinas' ambition would not be politically viable. He would instead have to sign individual bilateral trade agreements with the non-NAFTA nations. In any case, Salinas was on a winning streak. Not only had he saved Mexico, but he put his country on the path to prosperity. The Mexican economy was revived, and the lost decade was replaced with well-founded optimism. Despite these mammoth achievements, his to-do list remained unfinished. He still had to guide Mexico into a democracy. Here's where things get strange. Many democracies emerged from the ashes of a military conflict. The US had to fight the British, 
and Germany and Japan had to be leveled to the ground before democracy arrived. Mexico's transformation into democracy would be more peaceful, but not perfectly peaceful. Salinas had to determine where the PRI ended and the Mexican government began. Up to this point, the PRI and the government were one and the same. The president had to enforce hard boundaries that infuriated the old guard of the PRI. In order for Mexico to win, the PRI had to lose. And politicians hate losing. Salinas and his more democratic allies created new electoral agencies. These agencies were nonpartisan and would verify the legitimacy of future elections. New election rules were put into place, notably voter ID laws and multi-party election observers. In some elections, foreign observers were involved to ensure democratic legitimacy. The democratization of Mexico would arrive suddenly. In the 1989 gubernatorial race of Baja California, a member of the PAN party won the election. For the first time in nearly 60 years, someone outside of the PRI would lead a Mexican state. Salinas congratulated the opposition governor on his victory. This was a great sign that democracy was taking hold in Mexico. But the old guard of the PRI was not amused. Con la dirección de un partido inepto, es imposible conquistar el poder. Nuestro no es un partido inepto. El nuestro es un partido en lucha. No es ni siquiera un partido en crisis. O se cree apasionadamente en el partido. O no se es priista. Y si algunos quieren el poder, que no lo quiten, si pueden. But Salinas remained firm. Mexico was now a democracy, and the old guard at the PRI would have to accept that. By opening the door to democracy, Salinas made a lot of enemies within his own party, and the president wasn't done. Despite moving Mexico towards democracy, Salinas continued the practice of choosing his successor to lead the PRI. In normal times, Victor Camacho would have been the obvious choice. Camacho had various cabinet positions, and was close friends with Salinas. But these were not normal times for Mexico. Instead of following with party tradition, Salinas chose Luis Colosio. Colosio was a longtime member of the PRI, but was firmly planted at the Democratic wing of the party. And he wasn't afraid to condemn the more corrupt elements of his own party. Yo veo un Mexico con hambre y con sed de justicia. Un México de gente agraviada, de gente agraviada por las distorsiones que imponen a la ley. Sabemos que el origen de muchos de nuestros males se encuentra en una excesiva concentración del poder. Selecting Colosio to inherit the PRI was the smart move to ensure democracy in Mexico. Should the PRI win the 1994 election? Colosio would undoubtedly keep Mexican democracy intact, but Colosio would never see the election results. While campaigning in Tijuana, Colosio's life would come to a sudden end. The candidate was taken out by a lone shooter. Señor Licenciado Luis Donaldo Colosio, candidato del Partido Revolucionario Institucional a la Presidencia de la República, Theories of who truly dispatched Colosio remain a hotly debated topic in Mexico. He had made plenty of enemies within the PRI, and it is only natural to speculate that the old guard of the party was behind the plot. The shooter was identified as Mario Martinez, and he was clearly mentally disturbed. His personal journal revealed that he believed that he was sent by Aztec spirits to take out Colosio. But that was an unsatisfactory explanation for many Mexicans, including Colosio's widow. She believed that greater forces were at play in her husband's death. Colosio's father has similar suspicions. Speculations of foul play were further fueled when another high-ranking PRI member was taken out. This time, it was Jose Ruiz Maciel. 
a close political ally of Salinas, and also his brother-in-law. Masio's death only fueled the speculation of who is behind the murder of Colosio. It seemed that the anti-democratic wing of the PRI was eliminating their enemies. The death of Colosio is quite analogous to that of JFK. Both men embodied the spirit of optimism, and both were taken out in plain daylight. Many people in both countries are unsatisfied with the official explanation. Decades after the fact, both of these incidents are hotly debated. No matter who is truly responsible, Salinas had little time to mourn the loss of his would-be successor. He still had a country to run. To replace Colosio in the upcoming election, Salinas selected his campaign manager, Ernesto Zedio. After the appointment, Salinas would have to return his attention to the economy. With the recent political instability, Salinas needed to reassure the world that Mexico was still open for business. As Mexico was now an export-based economy, devaluing the peso would bolster both foreign investment and exports. Peso devaluation would reassure the world that Mexico was in fact ready for globalization. While Salinas was strategizing on how to best devalue the peso, Mexico was having a presidential election. For the first time in history, Mexico's presidential debates would be televised. 34 million people eagerly tuned in. Yo estoy aquí porque miles de hombres y mujeres libres de acción nacional votaron con libertad por esta candidatura. Y usted, con el debido respeto, quiero decirle que está aquí como consecuencia de dos tragedias. Por una parte, la muerte de Colosio. Y por otra, la designación presidencial. La primera lo rebasa. No tiene usted ninguna culpa. Pero la segunda lo descalifica. Por lo menos si hablamos de democracia. En primer lugar, y muy respetuosamente, yo le pediría a los señores candidatos que no lucren políticamente con el asesinato de Luis Donaldo Colosio. On election day, 77% of eligible voters went to the polls, and they chose to keep the PRI in power. But this time around, there would be no legitimate accusations of election fraud. The PRI won fair and square, and the opposition parties conceded. This was great news for Salinas. He could easily work with his soon-to-be successor to create a cohesive plan to devalue the peso, to greatly oversimplify. Mexico retooled some of their debt instruments to weaken the peso, and the plan worked, but far, far too well. On a single day, the peso lost about 14% of its value, and over the coming months, the peso would lose another 50%. This was far more than what was originally intended. A new financial crisis was unfolding, the tequila crisis. But this crisis would be much shorter lived than the oil glut crisis. Mexico's northern neighbor was doing very well financially and was able to create a rescue package for Mexico. The United States was happy to loan Mexico money to help stabilize the peso. In Washington today, President Clinton said that the economic crisis in Mexico is far too severe and its impact on the U.S. far too important to wait for Congress to make up its mind. And so Mr. Clinton has acted on his own to shore up Mexico's currency, the peso. I'll be sending a letter to the President this afternoon along with Gingrich and uh, Eshel and Gephardt, in effect supporting the President's position, so he won't be out there by himself. Dole and other congressional leaders like this new Clinton plan because of what it does do and what it does not do. It does help rescue Mexico from a financial collapse they believe could have shaken the U.S. economy. But it does not force Congress to vote on what looks suspiciously to the U.S. public like a $40 billion taxpayer finance bailout. But you may be seeing news, the White House. The bailout ensured that the very painful tequila crisis would be short-lived. Instead of experiencing another lost decade, Mexico would only have to suffer a lost year. The tequila crisis unfolded in the early days of the Zedio administration. 
as politicians tend to do. Zedio tried to blame the whole crisis on his predecessor. This is where Salinas made his biggest political mistake. The smart move would have been to remain quiet and let the tequila crisis fade away from the public's memory, but Salinas let his ego get in the way of being smart. He would fire back at Zedio in interviews, and Zedio returned to criticism. The attacks between the two former allies would continue for far longer than necessary. Few quarrels are more petty than politicians with wounded egos. And that was the case for the Salinas Zedio feud. The Mexican people were ready to move on from the tequila crisis, but the politicians could not stop playing the blame game. In time, Zedio decided to hit Salinas where it really hurt. He went after the former president's brother. Raul Salinas had a lot of money, a suspiciously large amount of money. And it was mostly stored in Swiss bank accounts. Zedio would have the brother arrested on money laundering charges, making it public of how wealthy Salinas' brother had become. The Swiss banks complied with Zedio's investigation and froze all of Raoul's cash. It's never a good sign if your money's too dirty for a Swiss bank. President Salinas had always had the stench of corruption around him, and his brother's dealings were too much for the public to tolerate. The hero of Mexico had lived long enough to become a villain, and his reputation would never recover. The former president was afraid that he would face his own corruption charges, and he fled Mexico for Ireland. His self-imposed exile would only further degrade his reputation amongst the public. Innocent people don't run away, and Salinas had just ran 8,000 kilometers to a country that doesn't have an extradition treaty with Mexico. The optics were very bad. When the dust settled, Salinas would return to Mexico many years later. He would attempt to rehabilitate his image by appearing in numerous documentaries. But the former president had his work cut out for him. A 2012 Excelsior survey found that most Mexicans have a very low opinion of Salinas. Of all the former presidents evaluated in the survey, Salinas ranked dead last. 65% of the respondents declared that Salinas was the most corrupt president on the list, and a further 64% blamed him for the tequila crisis. While Salinas does deserve a good amount of criticism, the hate he receives is a bit too much. Yes, there are some very serious concerns about corruption, but at the same time, Salinas saved Mexico from the lost decade, and he laid the foundations for democracy. He is a complex man that cannot be categorized as purely good nor purely evil. No matter your opinions on Salinas, it can't be denied that he forever changed the North American continent. Changes that would bring prosperity to all three amigos and enhance cultural pollination across borders. Salinas may have had the greatest impact on North America than any other individual in history. Sure, there are plenty of figures that influence Canadian U.S. history and U.S. Mexican history, but as for who had the greatest influence on all of North America, I think that honor belongs to Carlos Salinas. I challenge all history buffs to prove me wrong in the comments section. Just don't be a jerk about it. I got feelings too. In any case, we have yet to see the full effect of the Salinas legacy. Due to Salinas' creation of NAFTA, Mexico will replace China and Germany this decade. And both the US and Canada will eagerly make that happen. But that is a topic for another video. A video which is available now, ad-free, on Patreon. Click on the icon to start watching now. A big thank you to the Histories of Mexico podcast. Be sure to check them out with the link below for more things Mexico. And of course, 
thank you to all the wonderful patrons who make this channel possible.